This is the Linear Algebra Lectures video series. You can find more information about this video as well as a link to the written textbook in the description below. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about this video series and the associated teaching and learning tools I've created for it. Lecture 18, Linear Transformations. Our objectives for this lecture are to understand and apply the algebraic properties of a linear transformation, and given a transformation, determine whether it is linear, either by writing a short proof if the transformation is linear, or by finding a counterexample if the transformation is not linear. So to get us started, let's remember that when we defined multiplying a matrix by a vector, we talked about these two nice algebraic properties. If we have a matrix times the sum of two vectors, a times u plus v, that's the same as a times u plus a times v, that's distributivity. And then if we have a times the scalar multiple of a vector, a times c times u, then that equals c times a times u, and I called that compatibility. So it turns out that when we have a matrix transformation, and we talked about matrix transformations back in the previous lecture, that T of u plus v is a times u plus v, which is a u plus a v, and that's equal to T of u plus T of v. And so this property that T of u plus v equals T of u plus T of v, when T is a matrix transformation, we call that T respecting vector addition, that T interacts nicely with the vector addition operation. Now similarly, if again t is a matrix transformation, t of x equals a times x, then t of c times u, where c is a scalar, that's equal to c times t of u, and we call this t respecting scalar multiplication. And again, this just means that t interacts nicely with that vector operation. So when we have any transformation from Rn to Rm that has these two respecting properties, where we have a transformation that respects vector addition and respects scalar multiplication, where t of u plus v equals t of u plus t of v, and t of c times u equals c times t of u, when we have a transformation that has those two properties, we call that a linear transformation. And what we've seen is that every matrix transformation has these two properties. So every matrix transformation is a linear transformation, but we could imagine that there could be other transformations out there that might not be matrix transformations, but yet still have these two properties. Let's look at an example. So here we have a transformation from R2 to R3 given by this formula. So T of the vector x1, x2 equals the vector 2x2, x1 minus x2, 3x1. And we wanna prove that T is a linear transformation. First of all, don't get freaked out by the fact that t is written horizontally there. This is just the same as writing t of the vectors as you see it written here. It's just sometimes more convenient to write it horizontally like this to save space. Now, what do we have to do to show that t is a linear transformation? Well, the definition of linear transformation is that t has those two respect properties. So we first have to show that t respects vector addition. What does that mean? That means that we have to show that for any vectors u and v, that t of u plus v equals t of u plus t of v. It won't be enough to just do that for some specific vectors with numbers in them. We have to use arbitrary vectors. So I'll say let u equal the vector u1, u2, and v be the vector v1, v2. Now we're going to work out t of u plus v and t of u plus t of v and show that they're the same. Now first we need to work out what t of u plus v is. So that's t of the vector u1, u2 plus the vector v1, v2. We add those two vectors together and get t of u1 plus v1, u2 plus v2. So how do we evaluate that? Well, what we're gonna do is match up the two entries of that input vector. So u1 plus v1 is my first entry, so that's my x1 that I'm plugging in. And u2 plus v2, that's my second entry of my input vector, so that's the x2. So if I match that up with my formula, the resulting vector is going to have three entries, and it's gonna match up with the formula that I have for t of x. Everywhere I see an x1 in that formula, I'm gonna replace it with u1 plus v1. And everywhere I see an x2 in that formula, I'm gonna replace it with a u2 plus v2. And now for t of u plus t of v, we separately compute t of u and t of v, again using the definition of our function. So we get these two vectors that we then add together. So the whole point of this transformation being linear would be to show that these two resulting vectors are the same, that t of u plus v is equal to t of u plus t of v. So are these two vectors equal? Well, we look at each of the three entries and see if those two algebraic expressions represent the same expression no matter what the vectors u and v are. So in this case, our first entries, on the left, we have 2 times the quantity u2 plus v2, but that's equal to 2u2 plus 2v2 if we distribute the multiplication. In the second entry, we have u1 plus v1 minus the quantity u2 plus v2, 
And if we distribute the negative and rearrange, we see that those are equal. And the third entries are similarly equal if we distribute the multiplication by 3. So that shows us that, yes, these two vectors are equal. But that's not enough to show that our transformation is linear. For a transformation to be linear, it has to both respect vector addition and respect scalar multiplication. So now we have to show that second part. We have to show that t respects scalar multiplication. So for scalar multiplication, we have to show that t of c times u is equal to c times t of u for any vector u and any scalar c. So we'll start by saying let u be a vector, and again I'll call it u1, u2, and let c be a scalar. And again, our goal is to show that t of c times u is equal to c times t of u. So we'll plug in our vector u1, u2. On the left, we're doing the scalar multiplication first, and on the right, we'll evaluate our function first and then multiply by our scalar. And again, we're using the definition of t to evaluate these vectors. And now the question, just like before, is to figure out are these two vectors equal? And we'll go entry by entry. In the first entry, we have 2 times c times u2, but that's the same as c times 2 times u2. Remember, these are all scalars, so we can rearrange that multiplication however we want. In the second entries, we can distribute the multiplication by c, so that shows us that those two are equal. And then similarly in the third entries, we can rearrange the multiplication to show that those are equal. So again, we see that the answer here is yes, and we're finally done. After all of this, this shows that t is in fact a linear transformation. What about this transformation? So here we have a transformation from R3 to R2, given by this formula. And again, don't get freaked out by it being written horizontally like that. This is the same as what you see here, t of the vector x1, x2, x3 equals the vector x1 plus 3 x2, absolute value of x1 minus x3. And here we're being asked to show that t is not a linear transformation. So that means that we need to either show that t does not respect a vector addition or that t does not respect scalar multiplication. Remember that t has to do both of those things to be a linear transformation. So if it fails to do either one, then that shows that it's not a linear transformation. And what's more, we don't need to show that t always fails to respect vector addition or scalar multiplication. We just need to come up with one example. For vector addition, we could just come up with two specific vectors where t of u plus v doesn't equal t of u plus t of v. Or for scalar multiplication, we would just have to come up with one scalar and one vector where t of c times u doesn't turn out to equal c times t of u. So it turns out to be much easier to show that a transformation is not linear. So in this case, let's let u be the vector 1, 2, 3, and v be the vector negative 1, 0, 1. So I'll compute t of u plus v, and again, I'm using the definition of my transformation here to match up my three input entries with my two output entries, and I get the result 6, negative 4. And then when I compute t of u plus t of v, again, matching up my input vectors with my formula, this time I get 6, negative 2. And since those two vectors are not equal, that shows that t does not respect vector addition. And it doesn't matter whether t respects scalar multiplication in this case, because t doesn't respect vector addition, that is enough to show that t is not a linear transformation. For t to be a linear transformation, t of u plus v has to equal t of u plus t of v for every vector u and v in Rn. And t of c times u has to equal c times t of u for all vectors u and all scalars c. So one example of a pair of vectors where t of u plus v doesn't equal t of u plus t of v, that's enough to show that t is not a linear transformation. Or one example of a vector u and a scalar c, where t of c times u doesn't equal c times t of u, that is also enough to show that t is not a linear transformation. But if you want to show that t is a linear transformation, one example where t of u plus v does equal t of u plus t of v that's not enough. That just shows that it works in that one example. And one example of a vector u and a scalar c, where t of c times u equals c times t of u, again, that's not enough to show that t is a linear transformation. If you want to show that a transformation is linear, you have to prove it. Let's do another example. So let's say we have this transformation defined by the formula t of the vector x1, x2 equals the vector x1 squared, 2x1 minus x2. The question is asking, is this transformation linear? If so, we need to write a proof, and if not, we need to find a counterexample. So how do we approach this problem? Well, one thing that might pop out to you as you look at this function is that we have this x1 squared, which def that definitely seems weird. That seems like a nonlinear thing. So that might lead us to suspect that this transformation is in fact not linear, which means we need to come up with a counterexample. 
which means we need to either come up with a vector u and a vector v, where t of u plus v doesn't work out to be t of u plus t of v, or we need to come up with a vector u and a scalar c, where t of c times u turns out to not be equal to c times t of u. How do we come up with those examples? We could just start randomly guessing, but let's try to make an educated guess here. Because we have x1 squared, we want to take advantage of that weird squared thing and think that that may be where our nonlinearity is going to come from. And so we want to try to pick numbers where when we square them, something different happens. So that means we wouldn't want to pick an example where x1 equals 0 or where x1 equals 1, because when we square those numbers, nothing happens. 0 squared is 0, 1 squared is 1. We also might want to pick negatives, because when we square a negative, we get a positive. So that might lead us to pick an example something like this. I'll let u be the vector 2, 3, and c be the scalar negative 1. This is by far not the only counterexample in this case, but hopefully you can see how I was able to come up with numbers here that might work. So what do we need to do? We need to separately compute t of c times u and c times t of u, again using our definition. And when we plug in, we get t of c times u equals 4, negative 1, and c times t of u equals the vector negative 4, negative 1. And since those two are not equal, this counterexample shows that t is not a linear transformation. Now, linear transformations have some nice properties. We're going to talk about them here. So if we have a linear transformation, so what we know about t here is that it respects vector addition and that it respects scalar multiplication, then t has these two nice properties. t of the zero vector must equal the zero vector, and t of cu plus dv equals c times t of u plus d times t of v. And that second property, we might think of that as t respects linear combinations. So cu plus dv is a linear combination of u and v, and so we see that t interacts nicely with that linear transformation. So let's look at why t of 0 has to be 0. So we see the proof here, but let's go through it step by step. So for t of 0 equaling t of v plus negative v, well, any vector added to its negative, those are going to cancel out and you're going to get the 0 vector. But now once we have t of v plus negative v, we can use the fact that t respects vector addition to rewrite that as t of v plus t of negative v. And then t of negative v is negative t of v, and that's because t respects scalar multiplication using the scalar negative 1. And then t of v minus t of v, that equals 0. What about the second part of this theorem? So what about t of cu plus dv? Well, we first can represent that as t of cu plus t of dv. That's using the fact that t respects vector addition. And then we can use the fact that t respects scalar multiplication. We use that twice to rewrite this as c times t of u plus d times t of v. Now, we talked about the fact that t respects linear combinations earlier, but that was just with two vectors. And it turns out that if you have a linear combination of any number of vectors, that this still works, that t of that linear combination is the linear combination of the t of v's. And so the proof of that would be very similar to the proof of part two of the theorem that we just proved. Let's take a look at a real world example where we can try to interpret these linearity properties in context. So let's suppose that we have a company that produces three products, and for each product we have to spend money on both materials and labor. And so we might get a table that looks something like this. So what you see here is we have our three products going across the top, product one, product two, product three, and we have the material and labor costs per unit for each of those products. That would naturally lead us to put those numbers in a matrix. And so if we have a production vector, which might be represented as x, y, z, x is how much of product one we produce, y is how much of product two we produce, and z is how much of product three we produce, then the total cost of materials and labor would be represented by t of v equals a times v. Now let's suppose that we have a production vector for January. And again, those three numbers represent the numbers of units of those three products and a production vector for February. And we want to know what's the combined cost for January and February. Well, we could do this by first computing the cost in January and the cost in February separately, and then adding those two vectors together. That gives us 243.5 and 168. But we could also add the two production vectors together and then compute the cost. So adding J plus F gives us the combined production for January and February, and then multiplying by our matrix. Notice that that gives us the same result, 243.5, 168. What if instead we had a production vector for March, and we decided that for the next year we wanted to double that production? Well, again, we can do this in two different ways. We can multiply that production vector by 2 and then compute the cost. That gives us the result 288, 178. But we could also just double the original cost of the production in March 
So T of M and then multiply by two. And again, that gives us the same result, 288, 178. So these examples take advantage of the linearity properties that we've been talking about. So T of U plus V equaling T of U plus T of V tells us that the cost of combining production is the sum of the costs. We can either add the two production vectors together and then compute the cost, or compute the cost separately and then add the results together. Similarly, if we wanted to scale production by a factor, t of c times u equals c times t of u, we can compute the cost and then scale it, that would be c times t of u, or we can scale the production and then compute the cost, that would be t of c times u. And linearity tells us that we can do these operations in either order and we'll get the same result. Now we said earlier that we know that every matrix transformation is a linear transformation. Is the reverse true? Is it true that every linear transformation must be a matrix transformation? It turns out that the answer to that question is yes, but you'll have to wait to the next lecture to understand why. See you then. Thanks for watching this video lecture. You can find links to the other videos in this series and to the written textbook in the description below. If you're an instructor, you can contact me for more information about the over 300 online linear algebra homework problems that I've created for the free MyOpenMath platform.